laptop, sense, cell, cell phones, and any cement device that can distract or make noise during the event. The Berkeley Forum is a nonpartisan, student-run organization here at Cal, driven by students, for students. Our members work tirelessly throughout the semester to en enhance intellectual discussion on campus, for bringing speakers to talk about the most urgent ideas of our time. Every aspect of our events is run entirely by our student staff, from event moderating, photography, event invitations, financial development, uh, speaker liaison, and much more. If you're interested in <laughs> If you're interested in keeping up with the rest of our events, please find us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, or go to our website at forum.berkeley.edu. Tonight, the Berkeley Forum presents Editor-in-Chief of World Magazine, Marvin Olasky. After Dr. Olasky's address, there will be a student-moderated question and answer period, followed by an audience question and answer period. I'd now like to introduce Marvin Olasky. At a time of heightened political anxiety, the line that sets apart religion and politics is ill-defined. As World Magazine Editor-in-Chief and former advisor to President George W. Bush, Dr. Marvin Olasky has been at the forefront of interpreting world events through a Christian lens. On this 500th anniversary of the Reformation, Dr. Olasky will discuss the importance of understanding how faith can inform social and political opinions without each overshadowing the other. I'm now thrilled to welcome Marvin Olasky. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all for coming. I'm uh, honored to be here. I'm appreciative of the Berkeley Forum for, uh, for inviting me. It's been a couple of years in the, uh, in the making, and I'm able to joyfully be here this weekend. Uh, my third oldest son is getting married on Saturday in San Francisco. So um, we think of, we think of, uh, of marriage not only as a, uh, as a blessed event, uh, as the son you know from Princess Bride, but it's something that's, that's integral to the way we learn about the world, the way we learn about each other, and the way that, in some ways, two very different people can become one. And you think about our society generally, the way that we are torn apart, all kinds of political and social divisions with people screaming at each other, uh, sometimes even on college campuses that are places for discussion and debate and hearing new ideas, sometimes that doesn't happen. And if it doesn't happen on college campus, it's not going to happen in American general. And that's a big problem for all of us. So I'm very glad for the Berkeley Forum and the way it brings different people to come and discuss different ideas. And in a sense, when I walk around here, it's almost like I'm walking around at Fenway Park in Boston where I grew up and spent so much time there. Uh, when I'm there, more recently, I think as I'm going around a corner, I'm going to see myself when I was 10 years old. Walking to Berkeley this afternoon, I almost felt, well, am I going to see myself when I was 22 years old? Which is when I came here, I hitchhiked down from Oregon in order to speak to leaders of the Communist Party in San Francisco. I was a member of it at that time. And I uh, spent a night uh, on a interstate uh, um, roadside rest area, uh, slept on the grass, woke up sputtering and cursing at 6 a.m., cursing, and this shows you how old I am, cursing Governor Ronald Reagan, because I blamed him for having the sprinklers come on and disturb my sleep. <laughs> so I spent some time down here, hitchhiked back up to Oregon uh, along the coastal highway, slept on a beach, Woke up in a fog, I mean, I could not see my fingers in front of my face. But in a way, that's a metaphor for what I was during that whole period when I was in the Communist Party. I was always in a fog back then. And maybe now I've come out of it. I became a Christian in 1976. I can tell that story later if you're interested. But I want to talk here for a few minutes about the long-range perspective that I've been able to develop over the 45 years since I was in Berkeley back in 1972. And the way that perspective tells me that the, the sky is not falling, uh, despite all the headlines we hear, God holds up the sky, that Christians especially should not be ranting, we can and should reason together, and also that none of us should be running and hiding right now, in part because the modern world has no place to hide. Some of you here are not old enough to have that long-range perspective. I suspect that a lot of you first started paying attention to politics and news when Barack Obama gained election to the presidency nine years ago. 
uh, November 6, 2008. And in his victory speech, a very good victory speech, he spoke of how he and his followers could, I'm quoting here, put their hands on the arc of history and bend it once more toward the hope of another day, end quote. Okay, arc of history, that's, that's a very long range. And we teach our reporters at World Magazine to ask questions when someone uses an elegant sounding phrase like the arc of history, where does it come from? And that phrase is actually a concise version of what a great 19th century anti-slavery leader, Theodore Parker, I used to talk about. This was a sermon he gave in 1853. He said, I do not pretend to understand the moral universe. The arc is a long one. My eye reaches but little ways. But from what I see, I am sure it bends toward justice. And so you've heard this expression. Uh, President Obama used it a lot, the arc of history, the arc of justice. I sometimes have talked about the arc of compassion. Because if you have this long-range perspective, if you want to understand, in a sense, the difference that a Christian understanding makes, you don't have to go any further than, let's say, 2,000 years ago, and compare the Roman way of looking at things, uh, in terms of Roman worldview, understanding, religion, and so forth, with the new kid on the block, Christianity, what Christianity was trying to say. The, when, when Theodore Parker, who had been educated at Harvard and Harvard Divinity School, knew when he spoke about history and ancient Rome, he spoke about ancient Rome as a theater of cruelty, which indeed it was, of brutality. Uh, Spartacus led a slave rebellion in 71 BC, and the Romans crucified 6,000 of the rebels at that point. If you've ever been to Rome, the Appian Way is a road that runs up two ways and for, for miles and miles and miles, just crucifix after crucifix after crucifix. And that was very typical of, of Roman justice and, in a sense, Roman compassion. The corpses hung on crosses for, for several months as a warning of the rebels. Um, you may be familiar with, this, with, with Jesus being crucified. The crucifixion wasn't just for, for Jesus. The Israelites frequently rebelled. And I come from a Jewish background. These are my people. We are a rebellious people still. And Israelites rebelled constantly during the first century AD. And the Romans crucified estimates range from 50,000 to 100,000 of them. Again, the crucifixion just lined up and lined up, this torturous, brutal way of killing. And that was Roman justice. And Romans weren't brutal, only the rebels. Uh, the Roman ethos emphasized survival of the fittest, the eradication of those consider considered unfit, um, the eradication of children that a father didn't want. This was called exposure. It's kind of a post-birth abortion. You leave the babies out along the wall or in a field to be eaten by wild animals or to die of thirst or hunger. Um, that was the way it was. Eradication of human beings whom the rulers did not want, eradication of kids whom the fathers did not want. This is typical of the Roman Empire, typical of much of the ancient world. Romans practiced liberalitas. This is what defined, you could define it as self-interested hospitality. So you would invite to dinner, you would be hospitable to someone who was at your station in life or higher, so that you in turn would get an invitation to dinner or some other benefit at the same level you would offer or higher. Um, you invite a person, they'll invite you back. The ethic went beyond eating. Uh, be nice to a person at some other uh, an equivalent or higher station in life. He'll be nice to you. <coughs> and then in a sense, believers in liberalitas had a religion that was made in their own image. Be nice to a god, and he'll be nice to you. Offer sacrifices to the god, and good things will happen to you. So again, this is an ethos of, of kiss up to those above, stomp on those below, survive the fit. And if those beneath you rebel, well, it's them or you, so crucify them, wipe them out. Romans who practiced liberalitas were absolutely amazed, flabbergasted, discombobulated to see Christians practicing caritas. This is caring for those who could not repay. Liberalitas, doing something nice for someone who could do something good for you. Caritas, doing something for someone who probably will not be able to do anything nice to you. Christianity talked about people being compassionate and willing to sacrifice, not as part of the deal, but in gratitude to God, who is compassionate toward us. And no short-term political exigency should lead us to forget the importance, the crucial importance of compassion in our in religious life and political life. Uh, back in 2000, which is when I was uh, an informal, very informal advisor to uh, Governor and then President Bush, 
uh, his slogan was compassionate conservatism, which essentially was based on a Christian understanding of how we should act towards each other. Uh, we should try to help each other. We should look at all people as God's children. We should look at all people as our brothers and sisters and not believe in survival of the fittest. Christianity is different from other religions in another way. Uh, the word religion comes from the word religar, which means to bind in something, to attach to a particular set of rituals or commandments. Typical religious binding is a contract. I do this for God, God does this for me. Uh, Susan and I in India saw a sacrifice of a goat from a person who then expected uh, the God to whom he was praying to give him a child in return. Uh, make a sacrifice, maybe kill a lamb, and at the extreme kill a child, and God is bound to give you what you want. Uh, you invite him, he will invite you. And again, you compare that to what the Bible says, Psalm 51, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. The Roman Colosseum had spectacles of Christians thrown to lions because the early Christians would not sacrifice to various mythological gods or to the emperor who claimed to be a god. Christians said, well, there was a god named once, one time, and no one else could be or would be. The emperor said they should have all power, Jesus said, render unto Caesar only that which is Caesar's. So our minds do not belong to Caesar, our marriages do not belong to Caesar, and as I was just mentioning to, uh, to a, a gal at uh, Daily California, California Daily Reporter, our whole system of government is based on separation of powers, checks and balances, and that grows out of the biblical sense that all of us are fallen and limited. None of us should be supreme, none of us should be boarding over others. And then sacrifice. You can get a sense of what Christianity is all about by reading a book uh, that I recommend, and I can recommend a few others if you're interested. This one is by Alvin Schmidt, How Christianity Changed the World. Just listen to some of the chapter titles that give a sense of the contribution of Christians. The Sanctification of Human Life. Women Receive Freedom and Dignity. Charity and Compassion, Their Christian Connection. Hospitals and Healthcare, Their Christian Roots. Christianity's imprint on education. Slavery abolished a Christian achievement. I could go through a lot of history, but I'm only going to take a few minutes here. I'll, I'll skip to, to things that happened about 1,500 years later, the Reformation, which was very important. Uh, 500th anniversary, we just celebrated a couple of days ago. NPR actually tweeted Luther's 95 theses, uh, one by one. Uh, on, on World Radio, our daily podcast, we, we did that also. I'll just read you two of them. This is number 43 from Martin Luther, 500 years ago. Christians should be taught that he who gives to the poor or lends to the needy does a better work than buying pottery at his indulgences. Or number 45, Christians ought to be taught that he who sees a man in need and passes him by and gives his money for other things purchases not the indulgences of the Pope, but the indignation of God. So here again, you see this idea this emphasis on, on compassion, on charity. Um, doesn't mean that Christians are always compassionate, they're always charitable. Uh, Christians also have been fallen and sinful and wounded. But the, I've written a bunch of books. The, the book of mine that I would recommend to you is a book called The Tragedy of American Compassion, which looks at the history of American compassion going back to colonial times and continuing up to the present. And the enormous amount of volunteering to help the poor, the sick, widows and orphans. Theodore Parker, in 1853, had seen, with all the setbacks of history and the roller coaster of history, he had seen the history he learned, and I think he was accurate in this, he would seen about 1,850 years of slow, slow improvement overall. More compassion, the arc of compassion, the arc of justice bending, and this was a very helpful thing, a very optimistic thing. Um, he was optimistic that slavery would be abolished, indeed it was 12 years later, again, after that, you had, you had sharecropping and racism and Klux Klan and terrorism and everything. So lots of evil. But the ark had still been towards compassion and the beginning of slavery is part of that. But here's the problem that occurred right around there. And I think it's what we to what we've seen in recent history. People forgot why the ark was bending toward compassion, toward justice, and against racism and against survival of people forgot that. 
and the idea was to take a, something that was brand new at the time, trains. Uh, people were learning about trains, they had just started, and people understood that train, a train needs an engine to run. But in sometimes in politics and social understanding and theories of progress, a lot of people forgot that engine, and they thought, oh, this train's been running for a long time, it can run without the engine. And here's what happened. And uh, I'll, I think there, there are a lot of things that had an impact. Certainly, Karl Marx writing 1848, the Communist Manifesto had an impact, it's certainly an impact on me. Uh, later, in the, the end of the 19th century and 20th century, Sigmund Freud's understanding of impact, we can get into that if you want. But I think the single biggest impact, and I'm not going to get into the science here because I'm not, I'm not knowledgeable enough to relate to that, but I can talk about the social impact of uh, a book in 1859 called The Origin of Species. And I'll give you the full title of that, which I think evokes what the problem is. Uh, the or on the origin of species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. Read that once again. This is, this is the second part of the title. The preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. And in the Bible, there are no favored races. The Bible is incredibly colorful. It's, it's amazing to think of it. Uh, it really is. And there are no favored races. And it's really not a struggle. I mean, we all have to survive by the work of our hands. Uh, but it's not a survival of it's, it's not a zero-sum game. It's not a competition. It's not step on another person. Uh, we don't have to grasp it from someone else. I mean, we can work and earn. And we're supposed to help the poor, not step on it. But those who read and believed Darwin, again, and, and I'm not saying, I'm not blaming Darwin for, for this one. And this is the, the after-effects. They came to believe that not all people are made in the image of God. That human beings were the result of an impersonal war over millions of years in which the strong survived and those who were here would perish. This is a struggle for survival throughout the whole history of the world and the prehistory of the world. Um, Darwin's theory actually brought back the Ruralitas, kissing up the superiors, uh, cutting the characters, giving the hand to those in worse shape. Because if you do that, that's actually regressive. It's an attempt to turn back the progress that comes as the unfit die off. And Darwin's theory of evolution made belief in God unnecessary. So people could be, as, as uh, Richard Dawkins said, intellectually afraid of uh, During the rest of the 19th century, there were a lot of people in Europe and America who said it did not matter. The art would continue to bend for greater kindness, greater civilization, greater help to those in need, greater peace, love, and joy. Uh, there was a magazine in 1900 that took on a new name. Uh, it became known as the Christian Century, because its editors thought the 20th century would be that. Well, they were optimistic, and they were wrong. Um, you look at the 20th century, the bloodiest century in history. Uh, certainly, if you look at just three guys in power, with huge unlimited power, not, a check, not checks and balances, three people, they don't know Joseph Stalin and Mao Zedong, they together killed and murdered over 100 million people. I mean, the biggest lot in history. I mean, you can look back at some terrible things like, like the Inquisition, a terrible thing. But over the centuries, according to the history of the Holy the Inquisition killed about 5,000 people, which is, of course, 5,000 too many, still not quite 100 million. The 20th century, the century of progress, but it's going to be the Christian century, except that we have forgotten the engine, the train, became the most murderous century in history, and we're still going that way. And I think that leads to a lot of the divisiveness in American public life. Um, the, I'm, I'm, I'm almost done. You're almost going to be giving, giving a signal in a moment, so let me just conclude here. That uh, uh, right now you have people fighting each other, yelling at each other, uh, uh, tweeting in derogatory ways at each other. Uh, it's, there's a huge amount of bad news out here. And as a journalist, I enjoy in one sense having a front row of the seat, having a seat at the front of the surface, in front of the surface. I enjoy that. Uh, in other ways, it's dismal. And, and, and disappointing. But the good thing is, from the Christian perspective, is God is still in charge. And things play out in ways we don't know. We can't control it. We can't predict the future. But we do know the skies are falling as God can be the sky. And that's a great consolation. It's a great hope. Uh, and it's one that I think is helpful for college students who have all the years you have in front of you not to despair. Uh, the arc of history, the arc of progress, the arc of compassion uh, can still be heading the right way, and I hope some of you will have a lot to do with that.
So thank you, and I'm glad to answer questions up here and then questions from here. Thanks so much for coming to speak to us here today. Thank you. Um, I want to pick up right where you left off with the divisiveness that we've seen in uh, a lot of modern American political discourse. Um, in the dichotomy you presented between uh, liber 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 liberalitas, liberalitas uh, and caritas, where do you see the trend of this discourse in our present society moving? Um, and if it's moving in you know, the right or the wrong direction, what can everyday citizens do to further engage? Yeah, I think it's moving towards uh, an ethos of survival of the fittest. Uh, and different factions of American society are to define differently who's fit and who's not. But whatever, all over, you see a uh, real scorn for people who see things a different way. Uh, whether it's it's the, the coastal areas scoring the mid part of the country, I mean, this is Russia, over generalization that some politicians make, or vice versa. You see that scorn. Uh, you, you see people, uh, and again, I, I, I and, and you've been educating me about this uh, over the like, when, when I was in college, the word, the word triggering was really unknown. Uh, in fact, the idea was that college is supposed to trigger you in some ways. Now, I understand that sometimes it can, it can lead to, to you know, huge, huge upsets, uh, and people can be derogatory towards each other in a, very, in a very harmful way. I think all of that is harmful. But if someone says something with which you disagree, even something that, that, that frustrates you and annoys you in some way, that can actually be very beneficial. Um, much of the education I've received over, over these decades has been from people who just annoy me. Uh, and mm -hmm. I had to think about what they were saying. And, and uh, that, I think, is very helpful. There, there's an expression from the Bible about iron sharpening iron. It's not much sharper than much. Uh, it's, it's important, I think, that people speak forthrightly, courageously sometimes. Uh, you know, so 500 uh, years ago, uh, Martin Luther was famous for saying, Here I stand, and you know what? And he had death threats against him. Uh, other people that said similar things had, in fact, been killed. But he said, My mind is not captive, my mind is only captive to the word of God. And we should be willing and even eager. To speak out in a kind but, but straightforward way. We talk about what we believe. I don't think our democracy is weakened by discussion of things, right? As uh, someone who heads a uh, magazine that represents the evangelical Christian voice here in America, um, how do you think that Christians ought to carry on this um, kind of compassion within political discourse when there often is an kind of egregious disagreement between? Uh, a lot of different factions uh, in our discourse. Well, first of all, I'm not, I'm not sure the world represents the evangelical world in general. Uh, we, because uh, the evangelical, the evangelical world can also go astray in many ways. We we try we in the world we talk about something called biblical objectivity, which which may sound like a very strange concept. The word objectivity has been a powerful word in journalism for a few decades now, but it most often these days means a balance of subjectivities. Because there's often a belief that there is, there is no truth out there. There's nothing that's particularly true. Um, there's, there's nothing that's universally true. I mean, when I taught at the University of Texas for 25 years, I was stunned at times teaching a, a big introductory freshman class to, to future journalists, or would be journalists. And I talked to them about how the Baltimore Sun sent um, a couple of reporters to Sudan to uh, try to free some slaves uh, because, because the two English Muslims were enslaved and lots of Christians. And the Baltimore Sun did this and they had stories about how this all worked out. And I was just amazed that there were students who responded to that saying, well, yeah, this may be not a good story, but they were the Baltimore Sun people were coming from our culture and they were, they were interfering in Sudanese culture. And who's to say that our culture, which is now an anti-slavery position, is better than a culture that has slavery? Well, anti-slavery is really a universal thing. Uh, 
when, in fact, when, when our son, who was, uh, was getting married in a couple of days, was a small child, we talked about how people are not sacks of groceries. I mean, people are not things. Anti-slavery is based on this understanding from the Bible that, that we should not be enslaved. Uh, sometimes we are in service to each other on a temporary basis, but permanent slavery and passing on from one to another, that's wrong. So if there are certain things that are, that are universally true and right, and there are certain things that are universally wrong, we believe that biblical objectivity is something that, that since God created the world, God in a sense built our house, when uh, my wife and I in a house in Austin, Texas, the builder at one point lived next door to work, when we wanted to find out something about our house, we asked the builder. So we think the biblical objectivity is asking the builder of our house, namely God, what this house is made of. And the way we learn that is by reading the Bible and applying it. So that's what we try to do. And some, some evangelicals may go in a lot of different directions, but our sense is, is uh, you know, here we stand, we try to, to we try to stand in the Bible, applying it when we can. And you know, when the Bible is silent on these kinds of things, we don't say that our opinions are the Bible's opinions. You know, we are very limited in following, we make mistakes. So we try to differentiate things the Bible is clear on with things the Bible is and I don't think the Bible has uh, something to say about uh, water use in California right now. Uh, but the Bible does have things to say about life and education and other things. So, so in some sense, do you see, I guess, the biblical objectivity of uh, World Magazine to be a solution to this realistic discourse that you see in kind of a lot of American society? Or is it not kind of an end-all, be-all solution? Well, I don't know if it's, if it's a solution because, again, I mean, we, we make mistakes, but when we practice biblical objectivity, and we, from our study of, of history, we think that, that goes along with scripture. It's not that there are, these are two things that war with each other. Uh, yeah, I think I think that's a that's a very useful position to put forward. Other people in America have to put forward other positions, and having a discussion and debate about that is helpful. So. I don't, I do not want to be a um, uh, dictator. I don't think any of us are, are ready to do that. Um, so I, I think the discourse is useful. So we put forward this position, we try to put forward honestly. Uh, people at Time Magazine, we put forward a different position. Uh, people on, on the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Washington Post, we put forward a different position. Uh, we read them, some of them read us, and hopefully we learn from each other. Um, as you mentioned, uh, this discourse and debate of great ideas um, is, is what, you know, has the capacity to solve this realistic discourse. Um, but for those that don't particularly align with, say, the evangelical um, worldview, how do you think those people, whether or not they're journalists, um, who don't operate under, I guess, kind of an understanding of, that, of God's unconditional love, how do they fulfill their obligation and responsibility to um, bring different sides of the table together? Is that something that they can do without um, a Christian worldview? Right. Um, it's good. If, if you have a, if someone has a, um, um, a Jeffersonian worldview, and Thomas Jefferson was, was, uh, was a very smart guy who wasn't exactly worth watching his Christian understanding. But if you have a Jeffersonian world, you know, he respected others, he respected John Adams. Uh, those of you who have studied American history, it's a, it's a great story about how they were political enemies. But once they were no longer president, they, they uh, uh, wrote letters back and forth to each other. And then, and then in, in, in God's providence, uh, both of them died on exactly the same day, July 4, 1826, 50 years after the uh, official signing of the Declaration of Independence, even though it was really July 2nd. But close enough. Uh, Jefferson and Adams uh, respected each other. Uh, there are a lot of people. I mean, I'll tell you uh, uh, one person I've interviewed who used to be me, uh, John Dickerson, who is on CBS now and uh, Face the Nation, I think is I think is his. his I respect him a lot. Uh, he comes, he has a different worldview, but he's an he's an honest person who does not propagandize. Uh, there are there are a lot of people. Uh, like that, and respect, and, and some of them may actually be foolish enough to respect me, and we learn from each other. So, I think a Christian worldview really helps in this way because you have the theology of that, that all of us are created in God's image. I think a, 
a, uh, a communist worldview, which I, which I know since I, since I once had it, uh, doesn't help in that way because to get a seat on the Supreme Court. And uh, a person who was criticizing me at that time was a senator from Ohio named Howard Metzenbaum, a Democratic senator, and Thomas had been a Republican appointed in the Reagan administration, and then on the Supreme Court. And our three-year-old son, as we were watching through the hearings, uh, heard Clarence Thomas say, and he may have said this a couple of times, God is my judge, not you, Senator Messenger. And so for weeks after that, Daniel, for some reason, went around saying, God is my judge, not you, Senator Messenger. And so <laughs> I think of that also. Uh, we, are, we are not the judges of each other. I think with a Christian understanding, it helps. Because you know that God is God is the judge. I don't know, I don't know deep down in the in the mentality of any of you with the possible exception of my life. Uh, and that's important. We are not each other's judge. God is our judge. Uh, and we should have no and, and I learned this by the way about some of the medicine wrong, because I, I post some of these things politically, but there are other times that he did some some very helpful things on adoption, for example. So again, no permanent opponents, certainly no enemies. We have temporary opponents, but we should look whenever we can to make alliances with others. Uh, unfortunately, for the sake of time, this will be my last question before we turn things over uh, to our lovely audience to ask a question. A lovely audience, indeed. Uh, yes. Um, with kind of this, um, you, you focus a lot of your work, um, both now and in the past, on the intersection of religion and politics. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that has tied uh, in your work things like giving to uh, the Christian faith in relation with um, the policy agenda associated with the Republican Party. Um, Part the Republican Party. Yeah. Has, has that evolution, has that relationship between faith uh, and between political affiliation um, changed significantly from the time where you were involved with that agenda setting to now? And do you think that's a good thing? Um, <clears throat> good question. No, I think I think everyone has a faith of some sort. So an expression that came common two decades ago was faith-based organizations, and that's kind of a, a silly expression in some way because because everyone believes in some faith, uh, believe in something. Even all of you, you get up in the morning and do what you do because of faith in something. So so faith plays a prominent role always in politics, and it played a prominent role 20 years ago. It plays a prominent role now. Uh, I don't see much of a change. Religious views play a prominent role. They did 20 years ago, they, they, you know, they always have. Um, what I think has changed is, is much less interest on the part of uh, both parties, I'd say, in compassion. Much more interest in power and using a temporary majority to get what we want. And Democrats have done it, Republicans have done it. Uh, and what I'm arguing for, I suppose, is, is a long historical perspective. Uh, which is, which I don't see the part of either party or any or any, or any of these right now. They all want what they want right now, and they're not really thinking about what's going to happen if you get to the left. So, yeah, it's hard. Yeah. Uh, well, Dr. Lasky, thank you so much for answering my questions. Um, now, if anybody in the audience has questions for uh, Dr. Lasky, please raise your hand, uh, and I'll try, try and get to you, and uh, please remember to speak. What would you say that Kuiper offers as a way to think about things? That is such a good question. That is the greatest question in all of history. This is my life. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, here's, here's a, uh, again, I, I, I know you have a lot of reading in the course that I don't want to have more on you, but uh, uh, there's a fellow uh, named Abraham Kuiper. He's kind of a hero of mine because uh, uh, he was a newspaper editor, he was a theologian, he was a pastor, and also from 1901 to 1905, he was amazingly enough prime minister of the Netherlands. He developed what was called sphere solvency, sphere, S-P-H-E-R-E. Um, and that was based on the idea that no one should be a Caesar, no one should be an emperor, no one should be lord over all the others. He had different spheres of authority in society. Government's a sphere. It's an important sphere, 
The government has, to use a biblical expression, the power of the sword is supposed to keep us from killing each other if we feel like it. It's supposed to punish killers. So that's about all it's supposed to do. It's supposed to be very limited. But it has that, it has that role, it's a very important role. Uh, education has a role. Universities should not be under the control of the government. Universities are a second sphere with their own influence, their own leaders, and so forth. Um, business is a different sphere. Another, again, a very important sphere because that's how we, we don't starve to death in many ways. But again, we want it to be a separate sphere with its own area of authority. We don't want it to jump on others or lord over others. We also don't want it to be under the thumb of government. We want it to have, to have some independence. The press is a separate sphere. The reason we have the First Amendment guaranteeing freedom of the press is our founders thought the press was very important as the last defense against totalitarianism, against the you have checks and balances in society, but if they're all brought together um, and the courts were also part of it and the state legislature no longer had much authority, the press was the last defense. So it's a separate sphere. Uh, agriculture is a separate sphere. All these separate spheres, and they all check and balance each other to an extent. You can all operate in them, you can take leadership in them, and that's the way you keep the society from turning into a dictatorship. Follow up question? You look like you want to ask one. You failed to mention family and church. I failed to mention family and church, but happily, happily, we have a, the most brilliant student here, a little bit older than family, but still to a, yes, I, I, didn't marry, I didn't mention family and church, and I should have, I don't know how I neglected that, maybe because I mentioned it before, but I, but I should. Family and church are in some ways the most important. Family is the, is the original government that we all have, church, whatever you know, we are blessed in the society they have to have um, freedom of religion, also part of the First Amendment. But that's also a second sphere. Government should not be telling churches what to do. Churches, as churches, should not be willing to government what to do. Individual Christians, or right now in our society, individual Jews, individual Muslims, individual Hindus, individual Buddhists, should all be acting politically and trying to communicate their worldview and how it affects politics. But it's, it's helpful. That, uh, that we don't have a dictatorship. And, it's, and what Kuiper said basically is you have all these spheres, and the more you do that, you keep it decentralized, you don't have one center of power, voting over the others, and that's where you have freedom. Yes, sir, Matt. Uh, the evangelical vote turned out heavily for now President Trump uh, during the election. What specific interest do you think President Trump represents to evangelical voters? That's a really good question, and, and some of it an embarrassing question for me. The answer to that I don't know what. Well. Um, in World, we did a we did a monthly survey of evangelical leaders in 2015 and 2016, early 2016, and and Donald Trump initially had almost zero support. Uh, a lot of different candidates. There were 70 different candidates, and Donald Trump was pretty close to the bottom. Okay. Then, one by one, the candidates fall off. There's a, there's a huge story behind all of that. It's a weird story, but, but he becomes the nominee. And at that point, there are all these evangelicals who were not for Donald Trump are saying, well, here's the choice. One, one of the things that most characterize evangelical politics right now is a concern for sanctity of life, which means being opposed to abortion. And so, they have a choice at that point. Uh, well, they don't vote at all, in essence. Or they vote for Hillary Clinton, who was very much in favor of, of abortion many times, and very much involved with Planned Parenthood and the abortion part of that. Or Donald Trump, who a lot of them initially found very distasteful and still found distasteful, but they could not bring themselves to vote for Donald Trump, excuse me, for Hillary Clinton. And they didn't want to just mark the ballot, not, not, not vote at all, and so they ended up voting for Donald Trump. Um, largely because the Supreme Court has become very important in our, in our society, more important than it used to be, and Donald Trump promised to have a Supreme Court justice who was not part of the, of the liberal majority. Um, that's basically what it is. It was uh, a choice. Now, now there's a problem, and I'll, and I'll say this, that, and this is a tendency psychologists talk about, uh, once you make a choice, then sometimes the tendency is to want to affirm that choice by saying nicer and nicer things about the choice that you reluctantly made, and maybe that's who we are right now. But the original choice was a very reluctant choice, and I, I have my difficulties with, with anyone who uh, 
idolizes Donald Trump and apologizes for some of the really silly things he does uh, or has done and some wrong things that he has done. Um, but I don't have a problem with, any, with anyone, whether he's eligible or not, who, when it came right down to voting in the election last year, just could not vote for Hillary Clinton and vote for Donald Trump instead. We understand that. Uh, but that should not lead us to start saying he is the most wonderful president ever. Other questions? Yes, sir. So um, you mentioned in the Roman times how they would leave the children to be in Bible and things. And that's called exposure. Exposure, yeah. So uh, I thank God that we have this country that uh, I don't think that would happen. But when we look at what happens in the womb and abortion and how people that is, uh, do you think that one day it actually could get to a level where our society is so broken where even children will be left out to be slaughtered to buy animals or because there's really like no difference like there's some people who even nine months before the baby is born they say you still have to like slaughter the child yeah. but then once it's born you know just <coughs> say that, that it has now all the rights necessary do you think that if, if this way society seems to be going where there's a departure from God and morals do you think that we would actually get there as a nation? Um, I, I have very little prophetic ability, so it's possible. Um, in 2004, just before the election, I had a debate at Princeton with Peter Singer, who was a distinguished professor there. Uh, and, and Peter, who was, was personally a very nice guy, uh, believed then, I believe, and I think still believes now, that parents should be able to uh, kill their children up to two years old two years after birth. Um, if, and, and you can even say, well, if this is in cases of disease or, or this or that. But the logically, we need, you know, at, the, at least back in 2004, we were talking to extend the further. Uh, he's a very smart guy. Um, and um, there are other smart guys who pretty much think the same way. Some say it, some don't say it. So it's possible. I, I, I hope and pray that won't happen. But I can see that. And, you know, with all the frustrations, I mean, some of you here, I don't know what side you're on, some of you may be on the pro-life side, with all the frustrations of pro-life people, and I, and I really thank God for all the work of pro-life people, in particular crisis pregnancy centers, uh, who offered them a compassionate alternative to, to abortion. Um, that's been huge, and I think if it hadn't been for those efforts, if things had just continued on the trajectory, in a sense, the arc of cruelty from 1973, and it hadn't been as objection to it and 3,000 precious pensions around the country providing compassion alternatives, we might even be there now. We might be in Peter Singer's world now. Um, I don't know. But, uh, I'm, I'm an American exceptionalist in the sense that uh, I, I, think, I think this is where the, the checks and balances we've had in this country um, based on Christian understanding have kept, our, have kept us from having dictators and kept us from having some of the same problems as other countries have had. I'm not an American exceptionalist in assuming that we will always be blessed in that way. I really don't. So, you know, I mean, I have, uh, I have maybe, uh, you know, maybe another 20 years got You know, most of you here have, have another 60 years or so, and uh, it's up to you, not me. Other questions? Yes. Uh, during Trump, you mentioned a lot sort of this, this concept of the rally talks, but also uh, sort of apply it as uh, survival of the fixed. Uh, you mentioned that this is sort of also the, the communist ethos. I was curious, though, it sounds like survival of the fittest also sounds very much like the capitalist ethos as well, that is, uh, the most fit um, industry will, will survive both together, corporations, etc. Uh, would you also say that capitalism is yeah. a it, it can be, it can be, but here we have a this is, this is you know, the, same, the same year of uh, the Declaration of Independence. Uh, Adam Smith was writing about uh, the wealth of nations in England. And Adam Smith, who also had a, had a Christian understanding, said that, that capitalism uh, is actually based on cooperation. Okay? Because if you have a state system, you can order someone to buy something or sell something and work in a particular place. But in capitalism, it has to be cooperation. If, if, if let's say let's say you want to you want to buy an ice cream cone 
uh, and there are there are very sellers out there. Uh, you are free to spend your money in any one of those thirty sellers. Uh, so in a way, there's a cooperative endeavor uh, between the seller and you, and provide you. You get an ice cream cone, he gets money. Now, there's competition among the thirty different ice cream cone sellers, maybe, uh, and those who make the best ice cream, or are most efficient in doing it, or have the best accounts, or whatever, those will survive. But the others are not going to die in the process. There may be a person who makes inferior, inferior ice cream, and he makes him out to be a very good maker of desk of chairs here. And actually, it is helpful for society, helpful for him, helpful for society, if he stops making bad ice cream cones and starts making good chairs. This is basically Adam Smith. And this is theory. You know, that actually it's cooperation. Uh, the seller and the buyer have to cooperate. The employer and the employee have to cooperate. Now, when you have someone who gets very, very powerful, and let's say an employee has no trust, you know, I mentioned slavery, but, uh, you know, sharecropping in the South, where, where there really wasn't much of a trust, uh, then that's not fair, and that is, in a way, the, the, uh, the landowner at that point is lording it over, the sharecropping. That's not helpful, but the reason it worked that way is because government and the southern states got involved in that, setting up special codes and, and segregation and things like that. Uh, you know, there's a whole school of thought, and I, and I don't think this is true by itself, but there's a whole school of libertarian thought that says, well, people left to themselves without government will get along. Uh, I don't think that's true, but I do know, and I think I can show historically, that when government gets too powerful, and starts commanding you people to do particular things, that's when things really get bad. Um, no, no economic system by itself, I think, is a, is a good economic system because it depends on the values of the people who are in it. And any people can take any, any economic system and make it go up and, and just go rock. So I would say that capitalism is by its very nature survival of those, but it can be. Communism is certainly, uh, by its very nature, I would say, survival of it is because someone has all the power and other people don't. And they just have to do what the people are in charge tell them to do. Uh, could talk a lot, and that seems to be wonderful. Uh, for the sake of time, we only have uh, time for one more question. Okay. Uh, yeah. um, Luke? Yeah. Oh, so uh, following on what you just said about communism, can you, uh, you mentioned you were a communist at, at one more of their beliefs at one point. What made you leave those beliefs uh, as fast as what you do now? Yeah, um, I'll try to do this very briefly. Um, and the one word answer is God. Um, but how that happened, to be very brief. Uh, um, in 1973, I was in graduate school at the University of Michigan. Uh, and one day, this is actually November 1st, 1973, I started thinking for some reason, and I still don't really know, I have a few guesses, but I still don't really know why I started thinking this way. I started thinking, well, what if Lenin's wrong? What if he really is a god? Because my communism is based on my atheism. And I just started thinking. Uh, I don't know why, but I spent the next eight hours basically in a chair. And I wasn't smoking anything at that time, uh, but just thinking about this and coming to the conclusion, I'm not quite sure where it came from, that there is a god of some sort. And that's when I left communism. And then it really took a three year period in becoming a Christian. And the, the, the strange thing about it is that I did not intend to become a Christian. Again, I grew up Jewish, was bar mitzvah at 13, and then was an atheist, had left Judaism far behind. But I certainly know I'm, I'm a Christian, because I thought Christians, you know, these are stupid people who worship Christmas trees. I was going to answer that. Not a Christian. But here's what happened, and I'll just, I'll just mention two of the things. To get a PhD, I had, have a, I had to have a good reading knowledge of a foreign language. And I forgot my childhood Hebrew, I forgot my high school French, which I was never really good at. And I, I studied Russian a little bit. I traveled across the Pacific Ocean and studied the freighter and taken the trans Siberian Railroad across Russia and stuff like that. So I learned some Russian, took a summer course at Yale, learned a little more. And so to keep my Russian going and develop it to a point where I could pass the test and the reading out, I just was reading all sorts of things in Russian. And that's some post Russian stories, which were hard for me to read. I was sort of trying to them. I finished them. And then I had one thing that would get into me as a souvenir when I was a reporter in Oregon several years earlier. It was a copy of the New Testament in Russian. I held on to it because I knew it through red books. And I started reading it. 
and reading very, very slowly, starting with the Gospel point of Matthew, the first book of the New Testament. Uh, Matthew's great, by the way, if you're trying to learn language, because they're always begats. You know, it's like you go through a whole chapter basically very quickly. <laughs> but by the time I got to the Sermon on the in chapters 5 and 6, I was really thinking, wow, this is something special. This is something about it. This is not, you know, as good as Tolstoy is, as good as this is something really special. Um, did that make me a Christian? No. But it was sort of knocking down the barriers. Just one other thing, you know. Uh, I don't know how it is here, but, um, Okay, I was, I was um, getting my PhD in, in American culture, which was a lot of history and literature, and none of the, of the regular professors there wanted to teach a course in early American literature. Mm -hmm. It was very untrendy, they wanted to teach courses in you know, cool stuff, not in early American literature, which is largely what pure and None of them wanted to do it, yet it was on the required course list for some of the, for, for American literature English majors. So someone had to teach it, they asked me to do it. I had never taken a course in early American literature, so I had a really pumped hard to try to learn about it. Okay, pure sermons. I was suddenly having to read, you know, John Cobb and Chris Mather and Jonathan Edwards and all these folks. And my sense would be that Christians were stupid people. Flew out the window. I mean, some people have called, have called John Lewis the greatest philosopher in America. Uh, it's pretty good. Um, you know, these others, they were all very logical, they laid things out, they argued, they, 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 they was, it was incredible to read them. And so I came out of that thinking, oh, there's really something here. And that still wasn't the end of the process, I won't go any further, it would take a little longer, but it was those two things I think were really crucial in sending me in that direction, which still longer to go. But neither of those two things did I embark on in setting out, well, I'm going to study Christianity. Uh, and so here's where, where I think of God's kindness, God's providence, God being in charge of things. And I say to any of you or you know the people who come here, and, uh, uh, you know, be don't you don't you sometimes don't know why you start reading something or thinking something, but, but don't throw away stuff too quickly. You don't you know, don't don't just don't just get so deep into one major or one specialty. And you don't have time to look around a little bit. And who uh, knows? Who knows what God is doing? Yeah, thank you. Thank you again to Dr. Lasky and to our student moderator for the evening of Spirit of the Room. Thank you. If you're interested in looking at more of the forum events, please find us on Facebook by searching the Berkeley Forum or go to forum.berkeley.edu. We'd love to see you out at another event in the future. Thank you guys so much for coming tonight. Have a good evening.